Human beings are inherently good by nature, but they are prone to fall into the trap of material benefits. At the same time, it is the human tendency to redeem oneself from dishonest ways. The story exhibits the episode of the life of a rat trap seller who has fallen into the trap of materialism and later on he realizes his mistake and tries to give up the temptation. Talking about the characters, the first and the most important is the peddler with rat traps. Trying to make an honest income selling self-made rat traps, who finds he must nevertheless supplement the minor sales with begging or thievery. He steals from one man, is mistaken for an old military acquaintance by another, and is tendered an act of such generosity by a young woman that it redeems him and forces him to change his cynical and pessimistic attitude. The next character is the old crafter. The peddler comes across an old man who kindly offers to allow him to sleep in his cottage overnight. Despite feeding him with warm porridge as well as tobacco and a pipe with which to smoke it, the peddler steals money that the old man unwisely revealed to him the night before. The third character is the iron mill owner. In his bid to escape the old man with the stolen money intact, the peddler cuts through a forest and comes upon an iron mill where the old man once worked. In the dark and confused vision offered through the haze of fury furnace of the mill, the Iron Master mistakes the peddler for an old regimental comrade, obviously fallen on hard times, and invites him to stay in his home. But he refuses, lest he be caught with the stolen money on him, without an explanation. The last character is Edla. Edla, the Iron Master's daughter, but kind enough, who puts such pressure on the peddler to come and stay in their house that he cannot refuse. Later the Iron Master realizes his mistakes and wants to kick the stranger out. Edla intervenes and manages the situation. Her kindness is the agency of redemption for the peddler who leaves her a rat trap as a present, stuffed with the stolen money and directions on how to return it to the old man. The story is set amidst the mines of Sweden rich in iron ore, which figure large in the history and legends of that country. The story is told somewhat in the manner of a fairy tale. It conveys a universal message that the essential goodness in a human can be awakened through love, understanding, respect and showing kindness because there flows a soft feeling amongst all of us. Material benefits are the traps and most human beings are a prone to fall into. Human beings do have a tendency to redeem themselves from dishonest ways, as does the peddler in the end of the story. The story opens with the introduction of a man who went selling small rat traps of wire. He made them himself. The business was not profitable. So he had to resort to both begging and petty thefts. His clothes were in rags, his cheeks are sunken, and hunger gleamed in his eyes. His life was sad and monotonous. The peddler was stuck by an idea. The whole world was nothing but a big rat trap. Its only purpose was to set baits for people. Riches, joys, shelter, food, clothing, were just nothing but tempting baits. Anyone who lets himself tempted by these baits, the rat trap closes in on him. And then, everything comes to an end. The world had never been kind to peddler. It gave him joy to think ill of it. 
It became his cherished pastime to think of people who were caught in the dangerous snare. There were others who were still circling around the bait. One dark evening, as he was wandering along the road, he knocked at the door of a little grey cottage. An old man greeted him. He was happy to get someone to talk to in his loneliness. He served him supper. The peddler played muallets with this host until bedtime. The old man went to the window. He took down a leather pouch which hung on a nail in the window frame. He picked out three wrinkled 10 kroner banknotes. He held them up before the eyes of his guest. He stuffed them back into the pouch. The next day both men left the cottage at the same time. But half an hour later, the rat trap peddler stood again at the window. He smashed a pane and got hold of the pouch. He took the money and thrust it into his pocket. He hung the leather pouch back in its place. With money in his pocket, he felt quite pleased with his smartness. It was not safe to walk on the public highway. He turned off the road into the forest. Later in the day, he lost the way. It was a big and confusing forest. To him, the world appeared to be a big rat trap. Now his turn had come. He had let himself be fooled by a bait and had been caught. Darkness was already descending over the forest. Finally, when he saw no way out, he sat down on the ground. He was tired to death. But soon he heard the sound of hammer strokes coming from an iron mill. He gathered all his strength and dragged himself towards it. The Ramstrow Ironworks was a big plant. The master smith and his helper sat in the dark forge near the furnace. Many sounds were heard in the forge. On account of all this noise, the blacksmith didn't notice the peddler standing close to the furnace. Usually poor vagabonds came there to warm themselves in winter. He asked permission to stay and the blacksmith nodded in approval. The Iron Master came into the forge on his nightly round of inspection. He saw the peddler in the dark and took him for an old friend. The peddler didn't know his name, nor had he met the man earlier. He told the Iron Master that things had gone downhill with him. The Iron Master mistook him for an old comrade of his regiment. He invited the peddler to come home. The vagabond didn't want to go along with him to the manor house. He didn't want to throw himself voluntarily into the lion's den. The Iron Master wanted him to give them company at Christmas. The peddler refused to go with them. The Iron Master's daughter Edla came to the forge to persuade the peddler. She thought that the man was scared. She looked at him compassionately. She requested him to stay with them over Christmas Eve. He didn't resist and followed the lady. The next day was Christmas Eve. The valet had bathed him, cut his hair and shaved him. The peddler stood there in a good suit that belonged to the Iron Master. Now the peddler stood before the Iron Master in broad daylight. Now it was impossible to mistake him for an old acquaintance. He thundered at him. The peddler saw at once that he was exposed. But he told the Iron Master that it was not his fault. He didn't want to deceive anybody. He had never pretended to be anything than a poor peddler. He had only begged to be allowed in the forge. The Iron Master's daughter wanted the peddler to stay with them. There was not a single place in the whole country where he was welcome. Everyone showed him the door. She wanted him to stay and enjoy a day of peace with them. She was against chasing away a man whom they had promised Christmas cheer. The man with the rat trap said no word. In the evening, the Christmas tree was lighted. He ate the Christmas fish and porridge. The next morning, the Iron Master and his daughter went for the early Christmas service. Their guest was still asleep and they didn't disturb him. About 10 o'clock, they drove back from the church. 
the young girl sat dejectedly. At church, she had heard a sensational news. One of the old crofters had been robbed by a man who went around selling rat traps. The eye master asked the valet whether the stranger was still there. He had heard at the church that the man was a thief. The valet answered that the peddler had gone but he had not taken anything at all with him. On the contrary, he had left behind a little package for Miss Wilmanson. The young girl opened the package. She gave a little cry of joy. She found a small rat trap and in it lay three wrinkled 10 kroner notes. In the rat trap lay also a letter written for Miss Wilmanson. He thanked her for being so nice to him as if he were a captain. He didn't want her to be troubled by a thief at Christmas. She was requested to give back the money to the old crofter on the roadside. He had the money pouch hanging on the window frame. It served as a bait for poor wanderers. The rat trap was a Christmas present from a rat who would have been caught if they had not raised him to captain. Let us now discuss the theme of the story, the first being indigence, which means poverty. Legelov puts forth the poverty endured by the vagabond in the very first paragraph. She describes his destitution. She tells her reader that though he sells rat traps to survive, the business was not especially profitable, so he had to resort to both begging and petty thievery to keep body and soul together. Even so, his clothes were in rags, his cheeks were sunken, and hunger gleamed in his eyes. The tone of the story is not one of the judgment. The reportorial manner with which Legilov simply lays out the facts of Vagabond's condition suggests that Legilov recognizes the impossible challenge of surviving poverty while also following the law and abstaining from thievery. The second theme is class. Legilov also portrays the Crofter and the Wilmansons, who represent respectively two socio-economic classes, that they are very distinct from each other and from the vagabonds. The Crofter seems to have his needs met, but he still relies on his cow for a living. In other words, he needs the money that the vagabond steals from him. The Wilmansons are the richest people in this story. They live in a large house on a spacious lot and Mr. Wilmanson owns a successful iron mill. Edla, the iron master's daughter, feels a strong desire to provide for the vagabond, despite the initial deceit of him allowing the iron master to think he was a former war buddy. Perhaps Edla feels this obligation because she recognizes that she and her father have so much why others have so little. The next theme is pessimism. Closely related to the theme of poverty is that of pessimism. Legilov interweaves these themes demonstrating how a life in poverty can lead to desperation and disillusionment. This is why the central metaphor of the story, the Vegabond's theory that all good things in the world are simply different forms of bait, luring people to their respective devices is so rooted in a pessimistic outlook on the world. This outlook originates in the experience of someone who rarely has enough resources to feed and clothe himself. The vagabond is actually quite happy when he comes up with the rat trap metaphor for the world because Legilov writes, the world had of course never been very kind to him so it gave him unwanted joy to think ill of it in this way. Furthermore, any act of kindness or generosity surprises the vagabond. Legilov writes that he is usually greeted by sour faces when he knocks on a door looking for food or shelter. The kind of the crofter comes as a surprise and the incessant kindness of Edla, even after they find out who they thought he was, downright shocks him. As he sits down for Christmas dinner, Lajilov describes his confusion. Time after time he looked at the young girl who had interceded for him. Why had she done it? 
what could be the crazy idea behind it? The man doesn't believe himself worthy of kindness and so he questions the motives of those who extend kindness to him. The moral of Legilov's tale is that people's actions often reflect the expectations that others hold for him. And for the first half of the story, the vagabond holds the pessimistic view that strangers simply cannot see his value as a human being. The next theme is hospitality. It is worth noting that the events of the story take place on and around Christmas Day. The biblical story of Christmas involves Mary and Joseph travelling to Bethlehem where they are told that there are no rooms available at the local inn. The lack of vacancy results in Jesus being born in a manger in a barn. When Edla appeals to her father to let the vagabond stay, she cites the holiday as her main argument. Legilov writes that morning, she had felt so happy when she thought how home-like and Christmassy she was going to make things for the poor hungry wretch. And when Edla speaks on behalf of the vagabond, she says to her father, I don't think we ought to chase away a human being whom we have asked to come here and to whom we have promised Christmas cheer. It is this very hospitality that the gifts the vagabond the confidence to return the money. In his note he writes, the rat trap is a Christmas present from a rat who would have been caught in this world's rat trap if he had not been raised to captain because in that way he got power to clear himself. The theme of hospitality exists at the center of the story's moral. The people will often act in accordance with others' expectations of them and that therefore people should treat each other well. The vagabond writes that their hospitality gave him power to clear himself, suggesting that he actually gained agency from their generous hospitality. The next theme is loneliness. The most subtle theme in this otherwise unsubtle didactic tale is loneliness. In each act of the story, Legilov introduces a new character who is motivated by their loneliness. The first is of course the protagonist, the vagabond, about whom Legilov writes, no one can imagine how sad and monotonous life can appear to such a vagabond who plods along the road left to his own meditations. The vagabond's loneliness and sense of alienation and isolation from the human community significantly contributes to his pessimism. Then there is a widower crofter who seems almost as happy to invite the vagabond into his home as the vagabond is to be invited. Legilov describes the crofter as an old man without wife or child was happy to get someone to talk to in his loneliness. The crofter is radically trusting of his guest and he goes so far as to show the vagabond exactly where he keeps his money and how much he has. The crofter is so happy to have human contact that he doesn't even think to judge the vagabond. And finally, there is Edla who lives in a big, mostly empty house with her widower father. She wants to host the vagabond for Christmas out of the kindness of her heart. But when the ironmaster threatens to throw the vagabond out, Legilov writes that Edla had felt so happy when she thought how home-like and Christmassy she was going to make things for the poor hungry wretch. The idea of a fuller house gives Edla joy and it is clear that her motivations are not entirely altruistic. She desires company. The Rat Trap is a story in which lonely people are motivated to be kind in order to feel connected to other humans. Let us now discuss the allegory in the chapter. The central allegory of the story is devised by the vagabond himself in the privacy of his wanderings. The vagabond has come to the conclusion that the whole world with its lands and seas is like the rat traps that he makes out of wire. He thinks of the world that 
It had never existed for any other purpose than to set baits for people. It offered riches and joys, shelter and food, heat and clothing, exactly as the rat trap offered cheese and pork, and as soon as anyone lets himself be tempted to touch the bait, it closed in on him, and then everything came to an end. This pessimistic allegory plays out for the vagabond himself, as he is tempted by the crofter's purse and ends up lost in the woods. However, Legilov demonstrates that through the kindness of others, the fateful allegory can be disapproved and the vagabond is redeemed. The writer uses number of symbols to beautify his story, the first being the crofter's cow. The crofter's cow symbolizes subsistence and is a marker of his economic status. The crofter shares that in his days of prosperity, he worked that land around Ramsdor's ironworks and now that he was no longer able to do day labor, it was his cow which supported him. Without the cow, the crofter would be without a means of supporting himself. This stability is what separates him from the vagabond. The next symbol is the signature. At the end of the story, Edla reads the letter the vagabond leaves for her, on which he signs off as Captain Von Stell. He never learned the vagabond's true name, so this label he gives himself, the name of the captain with whom the Iron Master confused him, becomes for the reader his only identity. Perhaps denying the vagabond a name is a way of Lajilov to emphasize his transformation from someone who is expected to steal and swindle to someone who is expected to be an upstanding citizen. In any case, the signature definitely signifies the vagabond's belief in his personal transformation. The writer also uses a few simile for the story, the first being forest like a prison. A while after the vagabond slips off the main road and into the forest, he finds himself lost. Lejelov writes, the whole forest with its trunks and branches its thickets and fallen logs closed in upon him like an impenetrable prison from which he could never escape. This simile demonstrates the vagabond's feelings of being trapped in a prison of his own making. Where he was sheltered and warm the night before, his actions have now landed him lost in a freezing wood with no sense of direction. The prison simile functions similarly to the rat trap allegory to demonstrate the feeling of having been ensnared, but it differs in the way that the prison simile draws on the imagery of the forest and its trunks and branches to conjure the architectural of an actual prison. The next simile being the lion's den. When the beggar born founds himself being pressured to spend Christmas Eve and Christmas Day with the Wilmansons, he is flooded with anxiety. Legilov writes that to go up to the manor house would be like throwing himself voluntarily into the lion's den. This simile simply demonstrates the grave fear the beggar born feels at the prospect of being found out for his crimes. The simile also underscores the sense of alienation the vagabond feels from other people. He feels that if other people are literally a different species and that he constantly in danger of becoming their prey. The next simile is the bait. In an interesting and seemingly conflicting statement in his note, the vagabond renounces his theft while also maintaining that the kroner by the front door of the crofter's cottage are in fact bait. He writes, You can give back the money to the old man on the roadside, who has the money pouch hanging on the window frame as a bait for poor wanderers. So while the vagabond recognizes that he has been transformed by the kindness, he also maintains that poverty robs people of agency when it comes to trying to meet their basic needs. 
The allure of the money on the door is still strong, despite the fact that he is being compelled by other people's kindness to return it. The writer also uses the I me in the form of the vagabond trap. The vagabond falls into the very trap that he anticipates at the beginning of the story. He is so charmed by his allegorical understanding of the world in relation to his little trap, trap traps, so sure that every glimmer of hope or opportunity to get ahead is nothing but a kind of poke or piece of cheese luring him to his demise and yet he still takes the money and gets lost in the woods on a freezing snowy night. After spending so much time thinking about this allegory, one would expect the vagabond to be more cautious and avoid these traps, but he falls into one just like anybody else. There is also an irony in the name of Captain Von Stell. When the eye master mistakes the vagabond for his old army friend, he is totally convinced that he is speaking to a man named Captain Von Stell. The reader, however, knows that the vagabond is no such man, and furthermore, the reader knows how anxious the vagabond is to avoid the situation. The eye master, however, remains totally in the dark. Because the reader is aware of the full situation, while the Iron Master and Edla are being duped, this qualifies as dramatic irony. Another irony is in the form of a fine fellow. As Edla and the Iron Master ride back from church after hearing the crofter's story of being robbed by a drifter wearing rat traps around his neck, the Iron Master tells his daughter, Yes, that was a fine fellow you let into the house. I only wonder how many silver spoons are left in the cupboard by this time. The eye master is being sarcastic, exhibiting a bit of verbal irony in the sense that he thinks of the vagabond at this point as quite the opposite of a fine fellow. At this moment he thinks of him as nothing more than a thief. Let us now see the imagery behind Ramsdow Ironworks. While Legilov uses mostly pastoral imagery in this story, describing the Swedish countryside, the scenes inside of Rancho Ironworks give the reader a sense of industrial landscape of the time. She writes, All the time there were many sounds to be heard in the forge. The big bellows groaned and the burning coal cracked. The fireboy shoveled charcoal into the maw of the furnace with a great deal of clatter. Outside rode the waterfall and a sharp north wind whipped the rain against the brick tiled roof. By describing the loudness of the forge alongside the loudness of certain natural formations like a roaring waterfall and the slapping of the rain on the roof, Lajarov integrates the industry into the pastoral landscape. There is another imagery in the form of a little grey cottage. Most of what the vagabond sees in his travels are expansive landscapes from the roadside. Legilov focuses on describing the Swedish countryside and the crofter's cottage is perfect example of her simple pastoral imagery. She writes, One dark evening as he was trudging along the road, he caught sight of a little grey cottage by the roadside and he knocked on the door to ask shelter for the night. This image of the crofter, who lives alone, just him and his cow on a small plot of land, evokes the environment of rural Sweden at that time. The various literary elements of the story let us now discuss. This morality tale of the late 19th century is based in a Swedish countryside. It uses a close third-person narration, focusing on the vagabond. The tone is neutral and measured, giving credence to the vagabond's pessimism without outright condoning it. The mood is, however, somewhat hopeful, especially through the second half of the story as the vagabond begins to be swayed by Edla's kindness. The vagabond is the protagonist, 
but there is not a character who strictly fulfills the role of antagonist. The vagabond redeems himself after stealing from the crofter, but no one in the story acts against him, except one could argue the vagabond himself. The vagabond steals cloners from a crofter and gets lost in the woods, where he tries to flee the town. When he takes refuge in a local iron mill, he is mistaken for an old friend of the owner's and the owner insists him for Christmas. The major conflict is that Vegapon does not want to be caught for stealing the crowder. Ultimately, the moral conflict becomes whether or not the Vagabond should return the crowder or keep them for himself. The climax occurs when the Iron Master and Edla return home from find to find the Vagabond's gift which defies their expectations after they learn that he stole money from the crofter.